So let's take a detailed look at the main board here and uh, we're only going to be concerned with the top side here because if you have a look at the bottom side here there's just nothing of interest there it's just all uh, passives bypassing and some regulation maybe things like that so nothing special at all. Now it might look daunting at first with all these distributed element filters and everything else but as we've seen before you can see that's pretty much a modular block approach and I've done a handy little overlay here that will uh, uh, attempt to hopefully explain all the different functional blocks and the signal flow on the board so let's get to it. So let's start by taking a look at the RF input in the top left corner. This section here of course contains the 50 ohm input impedance but that uh, little SOT236 package you'll see uh, four of these here these are actually uh, single pole double throw switches so they can actually switch in the uh, 50 ohm load and various other stuff. So we'll go to a higher res uh, photo for this and then zoom in on the RF section here and we can see that uh, the input is AC coupled there through uh, C10 and then that goes into U1 which is a 955C as all the other ones here, these SOT236 parts there, some form of single pole double throw switch which I can't find the data sheet for, if I can I'll link it in down below. But you can see that uh, one side of the switch there, I believe uh, pin 1 there, um, switches in um, C9 and R1. One, which is the uh, 50 ohm load there so it's not a permanent 50 ohm load input and you'll notice that there's actually four diodes unpopulated there so there's a distinct lack of input protection here so unless uh, there's something inside that little wimpy uh, U1 switch there um, th there's you know not much here at all there's basically nothing on the other side there is a tiny little diode D7 there but geez it's wimpy and if we scroll down here, we've got a couple of more of these uh, switches here. And there's some diodes, there's four diodes there. So I'm not exactly sure what's uh, doing there. But that looks like some uh, power supply clamping protection there. At least they start to have something now. And if we have a look at uh, pin 1 of U2 there, you can see that there's a controlled impedance uh, trace coming into that. Obviously, this is an input path where they can switch in some sort of uh, you know, system test signal, something like that. I, I don't know where that comes from, what that would be, maybe part of the self-test or, or calibration or something like that. So, yeah, that's coming from somewhere. But normally, that wouldn't be part of the measurement system. just allows them to switch stuff in. And a bit further down here, you can see that uh, VR1 there, it's got 20 written on it, and that's a 20 dB uh, attenuator there. And you can see that's basically switching in uh, C16, that, uh, that straight uh, controlled impedance line there. So it's basically, it's selecting either straight through or a 20 dB attenuator here. Next up we go down into a HMC, once again Hittite, they're everywhere, they've got the entire solution for this thing, uh, the HMC 307 and this is the digital attenuator so when you go into the spectrum analyzer and you set the input attenuation you can set it in 1 dB steps um, up to uh, 31 dB over and above the 20 dB input attenuator and that's exactly what this chip does so the software is limited by the capabilities of this chip but yeah, nice device, DC to 4 gig, DC to daylight. And I really like the way the designers have laid out this chip. Look at this, there's the input pin, and then there's the uh, two ground pins right there, so you can see all that uh, via stitching to separate the input and the output, so there's no uh, coupling there, and then the pin below that is the output. So from a layout point of view, it allows you to lay it out with a minimum amount of coupling. Nice. But we're not done with our input section yet. If we scroll down a little bit more, we'll see uh, the signal flow down into our next section, which is, of course, the preamp. This thing has, I believe, it's a, a 10 dB uh, preamp gain on it. So once again, selectable, so we expect to see the digital switches there, and that's exactly what we get. So it can either bypass the uh, preamp or switch in the preamp. But of course in this case you'll notice that the switches are bigger, they're a different package and we can actually get the data sheet. Surprise, surprise, it's another Hittite uh, part, a single pole double throw. Uh, it's a non-reflective switch up DC to not quite daylight this time, 3.5 gig. Uh, it's a non-reflective switch. You can see the internal diagram there. It's actually got internal 50 ohm uh, termination resistors in there. But uh, basically it's just a switch. It allows us to, so they use a combination of two of them. You can switch in your preamp or switch it out. Easy. Now that's all bread and butter stuff, but look at all these other blocks in here, and this is the complex operation of a spectrum analyzer. Not all spectrum analyzers operate the same, uh, but they use very similar uh, techniques. So what we're going to do is take a look at a basic uh, block diagram here, 
So we've looked at basically just one block here, the RF input attenuator in near the signal input there, and that includes the switching and the preamp and everything else. Now we expect to see a low pass filter in here, and that's what we'll see in a second. And then that goes into a mixer, which then uh, uses a local oscillator, mixes the two signals together, generates a higher frequency called the intermediate frequency. And then we expect to see a gain stage there. There's that gray uh, uh, amplifier block there. Uh, attenuator we won't see this in this one but it doesn't matter um, that IF then goes into an IF filter we'll definitely see that and then it goes into a log amp and envelope detector video filter and display but that's not quite how this one works we need to look at another block diagram for that and as it says here, most spectrum analyzers use two or four mixing steps to reach the final intermediate uh, frequency that we can then, uh, in this case, or do all digital processing and actually display that, because this is an all digital IF system instead of a traditional uh, analog spectrum analyzer. Anyway, so there's gonna, we're gonna see several steps here. By the way, these diagrams come from the uh, Keysight uh, application note AN150. I'll link it in down below. Highly recommend, it's one of the best reads on uh, how spectrum analyzers work and everything else so we expect to see uh, uh, in well in this case what we're going to see is two local oscillators the first one goes into the first mixer uh, and then the second one that goes into the second mixer here if we take a look at the first mixer on the left hand side there that's the green circle with the X there we need this because we need to generate a higher frequency than our uh, frequency range of interest in this case our spectrum analyzer can go up to 3.2 gig so we have to generate an intermediate frequency higher than that because if we don't do that then there will be uh, dead bands within the measurement window that just won't work so we have to actually mix that with a high mix our input frequency with a higher frequency to generate an intermediate frequency above our maximum 3.2 gig input range. And if we go back to our original block diagram here, what we expect after our input stuff is a low pass filter and then a mixer with a local oscillator feeding into that mixer. Do we get that? Well, let's take a look. Yes, of course we do. You can see the uh, preamp there on the left that we looked at before. It then feeds into a down into that uh, low pass filter, which is again a distributed element uh, filter there with the various L's and C's. And then that goes into a mixer IC there, which then uh, accepts the signal from above it there from that nice looking uh, bow tie distributed element low pass filter and that will come from the local oscillator as we'll see but it's a bit more complex it's not like the local oscillator feeds straight in we're doing some tricks with our local oscillator in this particular case but anyway the output from the mixer then goes into that uh, amplifier gain stage as we saw on the block diagram and if we take a look at a high-res photo of the mixer and that uh, amplifier, IF amplifier uh, stage, once again, we've got two Hittite parts yet again, the uh, HMC488 mixer there on the left and the HMC716 uh, amplifier. Let's take a look at the data sheets. And this mixer can go from 4 to 7 gig, which is exactly what we want. It's above our operational uh, frequency range of our amplifier. And if we have a look at uh, the specs here, then our uh, intermediate uh, frequency range, DC to 2.5 gig. And then our IF amplifier chip, the HMC716, it's exactly what you expect. It's a, in this case, it's an 18 dB gain uh, amplifier, but it's got uh, the bandwidth of 3.1 to 3.9 gig. So it's designed to operate within that range, which is above basically our 3.2 gig maximum operational frequency range. And that's where our IF frequency is gonna sit somewhere above 3.2 gig. The exact value, uh, we don't actually know unless we do more investigation or some measurements. But before we follow that intermediate frequency out, we want to see our local oscillator. Because I said before, it wasn't as simple as just the local oscillator feeding into the mixer as it shows on the uh, block diagrams for spectrum analyzers. So if we zoom in here, we can find our uh, first local oscillator, or our main uh, voltage controlled oscillator. And this one uses a ZCOM uh, part there for the VCO, the voltage controlled oscillator, and which is the big metal can there, and another Hittite uh, PLL there to form our local oscillator. Now this is made by a company called Z Communications and they make a ton of different variants of these with different ranges and things like that. And this one is going to cover the frequency range that we need. If you have a look at the uh, tuning voltage here, it goes from 1800 to 4200 megahertz or uh, 1.8 to 4.2 gig. And pretty much exactly the range we need here. 
And this is our sweep generator we saw in the block diagram on the bottom left there. The red sweep generator feeds into the local oscillator and then feeds into the mixer. But as I said, there's a few more steps after our local oscillator before we get to the mixer in this particular analyzer. But as part of that local oscillator, we've got a Hittite HMC703 uh, fractional synthesizer, which forms part of the ultimate uh, PLL local oscillator loop. And we can see that here, if we take a look at the uh, demo board you can actually get for this chip, it shows that there's a VCO integrated as part of the system here, in this case a Hittite HMC508, but in the case of the uh, Siglent Spectrum Analyzer here, we're using a VCO from uh, Z Communications. And if you believe the sales blurb here, check it out. This platform has the best phase noise and spurious performance in the industry. Yes, thank you very much. But once again, you know, decent choices being made here to enable a pretty decent performance at a low price point. Well done, Siglent. But even with all that magic, the output of the first main local oscillator here is not high enough in frequency. So it goes into a frequency doubler there, and uh, this is designed for a two, two to four gig input, so doubles that anywhere from uh, four up to eight gig. But once again, the exact bandwidth uh, frequency range we're talking about here, we don't exactly know unless we did further investigations or measurement. And the frequency doubler being used again, a Hittite HMC 189 here, 2 to 4 gig input as I said, so 4 to 8 gig output, eh, it's designed for exactly this job. And this particular part isn't obsolete, unlike uh, if you were very keen, you would have noticed uh, plastered over the data sheets for a couple of chips before, we would have seen that they're actually obsolete. So yeah, why they're still using them, I don't know, maybe there's nothing better at the price point. But we're not done yet, no sorry, Bob. The output of the frequency doubler here for our local oscillator uh, goes into uh, two single pole double throw switches, which then can select one of three bandpass filters. In this case, uh, the, this particular uh, physical arrangement, the distributed element uh, filter, is called an interdigital bandpass filter. And so three different frequencies. You can actually see that they're different uh, geometries there, which actually selects the bandwidth and the response and then there's three uh, single pole double throw switches on the other side. So the software can select one of three bandpass filters on our local oscillator. And these switches are different to what we've seen before. These are uh, VSWA2-63, blah, 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 blah. And these are uh, high isolation absorptive uh, single pole double throw switches with integrated CMOS drivers and all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. And we don't care about the quiescent current, really. Um, and 500... Uh, to six, 500 meg to 6 gig uh, bandwidth. Pretty decent. And we're almost there. I've mentioned this before. You can see the output of that um, one, that selectable bandpass filter there then uh, goes through just a little bit more stuff there and goes through another uh, bowtie low-pass filter. It's called a bowtie low-pass filter because it looks like a bow tie. That's where it gets its uh, name from. And then that finally goes into the mixer. So that block diagram we saw before and you see for all spectrum analyzers, the local oscillator goes straight into the mixer. Well, yes, you've seen. It's a bit more complicated than that for various uh, performance reasons. But if you're keen eye, you would have noticed something in between there. The output uh, from the interdigital filter after the uh, switching and uh, probably some little uh, buffering there or something uh, then goes into this odd looking uh, arrangement here on the board, which is coupling um, the signal to go over. If you follow the trace on the other side, it's coupling over to go up to the tracking generator local oscillator SMA connector and that jumps on over to the uh, tracking generator module we saw before. So finally, out of our mixer and then through our IF gain stage, which we've looked at, uh, we expect to find an IF filter and, well, you betcha, look at the output of the, amp the 18 dB uh, IF amplifier down here. Bingo, it goes into another bandpass filter, another interdigital uh, type. Once again, a different geometry in there uh, to give you a different uh, range and uh, response of the thing. And then that's followed by another uh, cute-looking bow tie uh, low pass filter as well once again just to take the upper edge off uh, something and if you're curious about how these interdigital uh, bandpass filters actually work when you can clearly see that both 
uh, like the input signal comes in and then it basically goes down to ground with a trace sticking up and then the other then the trace on the right hand side next to that uh, goes up to ground at the top side and then the next one goes down to uh, ground so how does this actually work well it's because we're at high frequencies here these work at you know several hundred megahertz up to you know several gigahertz or something like that they're basically uh, coupled resonators but they're also known as interdigitated coupled resonators so yeah they resonate between the two and then it propagates along and resonates and that's why you might see different spacing in there is to give a different passband characteristic for this thing anyway you have to get into real complex RF microstrip type theory to you know figure out exactly how this works and there's a ton of math into it and I'm sure you could google it if you're really interested but yeah even though it goes down the ground there it gets through but we said here before that uh, this particular spectrum analyzer arrangement uses uh, two mixing uh, techniques and so we need to find that second mixer and the second local oscillator as well and if we pan across here bingo the output of our filter there goes into another mixer uh, the 488 exactly as we had before but just like on the block diagram here, you'll notice that the output of the second mixer is a much lower frequency. It's within, way under, way within uh, the passband of our spectrum analyzer in this block diagram, 322 megahertz. But in the case of uh, this particular one here, it's actually at 810 megahertz. And the reason we know that is because, hey, look, we can look at the um, uh, filters on the output of the mixer and we can see that there are, uh, saw filters or surface acoustic wave filters and we can have a look at the data sheet for this particular uh, one they're available in all different frequencies this one happens to be an 810 megahertz saw filter so we know that's the output uh, frequency of the second mixer but this isn't low enough uh, frequency for now us to do digital IF uh, sampling on. So what we want to do is feed it into another third mixer, just like what's uh, shown here, to actually down convert it to a frequency that we, a baseband frequency that we can actually sample with like a Joe Bloggs, uh, you know, 16-bit analog to digital converter. And we can see that here, the output of the saw filter goes into this little white block here, which is a mini circuits. Yes, we finally get a mini circuits win in the design here. It's not all Hidite. Min mini circuits, one of the biggest uh, providers of uh, these sorts of uh, mixes. And so this will go in and we can take a look at the data sheet for this mini circuits mixer as well. But there's nothing terribly exciting to see here. It's just a, you know, basically five megahertz to one gig mixer designed for this sort of uh, application, uh, down conversion uh, to a baseband signal. But wait, we're not finished with the mixer. Every mixer's got to have a local oscillator input. Where's that coming from? Well, it, it is coming from the second local oscillator, but we need a much lower frequency. So you'll notice that the second local oscillator here, uh, as like feeding the second mixer across to the left there, it also goes up and that same signal feeds a uh, is divided by four and then that gets fed into the third mixer, which does the down conversion. So we've got our final RF uh, frequency bandwidth here and this goes into, uh, curiously, a single pole four throw switch and that's what the IC is. So I'm not exactly sure what it's selecting there. You know, there's some sort of different uh, filtering options that it's doing there. I'm not exactly sure what. Anyway, that then goes over into another single pole four throw switch here, which has only half the stuff populated. So that's quite unusual. Why did they leave that out? Now, as a user by the name of uh, Gozu, if I'm pronouncing that correctly on the EEV blog forum, uh, postulated for this one, um, it, it, I, it certainly looks like another bandpass uh, filter in there uh, with the inductors and the caps in there. And uh, that would be one of going into, presumably, one of the channels of U85 on the left hand side there, the uh, single pole four throw switch. And presumably, there would be a software option for this to have another additional bandpass filter on the final IF before it uh, goes into the sampler. So maybe there's even a secret menu option for it if you could hack the firmware or whatever, or maybe, you know, they had an early version of uh, firmware that decided they didn't want it. I don't know, it could still be there. 
Who knows? Could be interesting, but yeah, I don't know. If you could find it, you might be able to hack in your own uh, bandpass filter in there for some additional functionality. And the good thing about an experiment or hack like that is that you're not really, you know, damaging anything. You're populating existing footprints in there with an existing digital switch that's only affected if you enable a software option in the firmware to actually flick that switch and in you know put that uh, filter in series with the final IF there. So, you know, you can play around if your heart's content without really risking uh, damaging anything. So that's it, we're finally through our complete block diagram here, but this envelope detector, wah, we don't have that, because as I said before, this uh, spectrum analyzer uses what's called an all digital IF filter. So it does everything after the IF stage, the intermediate frequency stage, it just samples that directly with a high resolution, uh, high sample rate analog to digital converter, and then does everything in software. As we see in this uh, Keysight application uh, note here, here is how uh, the Keysight X series signal analyzers do uh, and all digital IF. They've got an ADC in there with the gain and the alias filter, everything else, but it goes into then a custom IC, which in this case would be that uh, Spartan 6 FPGA we saw is doing a Hilbert transform and then it's doing some filtering and then it can do the video bandwidth in there and does logs and powers and all sorts of and uh, the detector all sorts of stuff all within inside uh, that would be happening inside that Spartan 6 FPGA, no doubt. And then that goes into the pro, and probably it'll be doing the FFT in there as well. Um, and then that just goes out to the display applications processor, which we saw earlier. So now we have to go full circle right back to the main PCB under that uh, block where we found our main reference oscillator before. And what do we find? Surprise, surprise, an ADC driver designed specifically for IF baseband processing. In this case, it's the uh, National Semiconductor, none of this Texas Instruments rubbish, LMH6517. It's designed exactly for this, for a 16-bit ADC. And there's the block diagram down the bottom. So no surprises to find what's down below this. I'll give you one guess. And congratulations, you win a Brass Razu. It's an analog to digital converter. It's the analog devices uh, AD 9235. Actually, 12 bits. Surprise, surprise. Not this 16 bit rubbish, I guess. For Siglin, no, 12 bit will do the job just fine. And uh, yeah, it's designed for ultrasound equipment, <gasps> oh, low cost digital oscilloscopes. There we go. Winner, winner. Chicken dinner. And you'll notice that we've got the uh, dash 40 part there, uh, which means 40 meg samples per second. This part's available from 20 up to 65 meg samples per second. So at 40 meg samples per second, we know that our uh, IF baseband frequency has to be somewhere below 20 because, you know, all that Nyquist stuff, really annoying. Yeah, so it's got to be at most half of that sample rate. So I hope you enjoyed that sort of building block walkthrough of a spectrum analyzer, in this case the Siglent SSA uh, 3000. I did do this video a couple of years back, but it was embedded in the teardown and it was a new style of uh, edit I wanted to try where I uh, took my high-res photos and actually um, then just in my editor actually did the voice commentary with my mic here and um, uh, do that. Uh, over the top and then you know zoom in and pan and do all that uh, sort of stuff so that was I was quite proud of that and it was kind of like um, you know just tucked away in this uh, teardown so I thought I'd just take that out and uh, move it on over to a separate video and I've got a new um, uh, uh, monitor set up here I just wanted to try edit some video so I hope you found that useful and if you like that uh, style of teardown video, please me let me know. It does take uh, a bit more work than just my usual uh, thing where I just <laughs> literally like opened up and I stand behind the camera. I've got my little poker in there and I just like poke at stuff and then, you know, zoom. <laughs> Basically the zooming I do is zooming on the camera or changing the macro lens or whatever. And just, you know, waffling on, um, just press a record and figure out uh, something to say. I do the same thing here. It's not like I have a script or anything. It's, um, I still do sort of like the off the cuff uh, commentary and stuff like that, but it's done at the editing stage, which is a different style of video to what I normally do. So anyway, if you liked it, 
please give it a big thumbs up. Let me know down below. Um, I won't do this kind of style of uh, video for all teardowns because sometimes it's not appropriate. Sometimes it's just easier and quicker to do it just standing behind the camera and just do it off the cuff, just poking, you know, straight at the thing. This is still off the cuff, but it requires a lot more editing magic, and I'm not really the world's best editor, but hey, it worked, I think. Anyway, catch you next time. Thank <laughs> you.